Well, thank you very much. So I thank again Devashish Vidarbha Orthopedic Society for giving me the opportunity to be here. I graduated and post-graduated from Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Sevagram. So it's always a pleasure coming here. And it's a pleasure meeting, meeting my teacher. He's here today, Dr. Patond. And I owe my clinical and surgical expertise to him. And I thank him, take this opportunity to thank him for bringing me to a stage where I am today. Thank you very much, sir. So foot and ankle surgery, foot and ankle surgeons, I mean, we are not from Mars. We talk about subspecialty of foot and ankle surgery and we are asked questions about, I mean, one of our senior guys in, in IOCON actually met me and I about five years down, uh, uh, from, uh, back from today and he asked me, Toh, kya kar rahe ho so I said, I'm trying to develop foot and ankle. So he looked at me and said, okay, kuch ho jata hai? I mean, I mean, I mean to say, what do you do for a living? So that's not the situation. I think we are growing, and as a subspecialty, we are going to we are going to be there very soon, I believe. Now, first benches become foot and ankle surgeons, and back benches become joint replacement surgeons. Now you take it with a pinch of salt. May not be true. I mean, you, many of you may not agree to that. And today, if I say I'm a foot and ankle surgeon, there are very few people now would say that. But I. Trust me, about a year down the line, we are going to have ankle joint replacement in the country. And then there will be about 50 people saying we are all foot and ankle surgeons probably. So that is going to change again very soon, but that's a bit of food for thought. As a community of foot and ankle surgeons, we, we love high heels, we love fashion also. There are problems associated with high heels and fashions, and we all love to have patients. Sorry, that video is not working, but I think you saw a bit of it in the last talk I gave. Cause of a lot of problems in foot and ankle. They burn their heels with those much highs, but they still have, they have heel pains, they have bunions, they have corns, they have everything, and they still keep on wearing heels. And if a patient comes to me and I know the problem is because of high heels and I ask the questions, well, do you wear high heels? The answer is not too high. Well, it's only a couple of inches. And I'm like, okay, so that's all right couple of inches is not that bad. Now, one hour of a foot and ankle class, what do you expect? <laughs> I know some of you might take the opportunity to the maximum possible there, but, uh, but it's interesting. We'll try to keep it very limited areas and some brief points, important points about some very important points. Clinical parts a bit, a very basic radiology because I hate radiology classes. Maybe you will all do if I go into x-rays and MRIs and ultrasounds. We'll show some concepts of ankle fractures. A lot of it has been covered, so I'll skip a lot of that. And talus calcaneus and Lisfranc frank is probably I'm going to touch a bit, just the basic concepts. So use one finger at the right place at the right time. One finger is important. If you have a patient how many of us will ask a patient to point in foot and ankle, point the area of pain or trouble with one finger? We don't. A patient had his inversion pain about a year back, still comes to the OPD, keeps coming to the OPD, but we never ask where exactly is the pain? Use your finger to tell me where is the pain. That's very, very important in foot and ankle surgery because the surface anatomy is so simple. It's all superficial. So first use your finger, patient uses a finger and then you use your finger to elicit that pain. Many of these patients will have an obvious diagnosis. But before that, well it's the patient's story. Let the patient narrate. Back to the basics, patients can present with any number of symptoms, pain being the most important and it's, it's always, always going back to the basics to elicit, if you elicit when, how, what and where of pain, then most of the times you get a clue to why the pain is happening. So I'm not going to go into the details of the history taking, but it's extremely important to elicit everything about pain. What type of pain? When does it come on? How does it, how, what is the diurnal vari variation of the pain? How did the pain start? Was there, was there an overuse activity? Was there a trauma or something? Was there a running, jogging episode? And how does it progress? So if you go into the details of the history of pain, many situations, these answers will lead you to the why of the pain. For example, now we say the surface anatomy is simple. Suppose you have an inversion, an inversion sprain and still painful after a year. Now if you ask, is there, are there any PG students here? 
raise your hands pg students all right so couple of you guys stand up and tell me what are the areas if the patient has an inversion pain and one year down the line has pain in these areas and the patient is able to point out would you be aware of what is lying there 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 and there any one of you please devash is trying to speak something from the back a <laughs> quiz is after the session okay so he wants to save his pgs i think <laughs> there must be some of his pgs sitting there anyone else anybody else wants to take this up i know this is uh kind of if you have if the patient points a finger as c at the level of the joint is probably an anterior lateral ankle impingement pain the area of exact tibio uh, anterior tip, uh, talofibular ligament is here that is exactly at the anterior border of the lateral malleolus and going distally towards the talus that is the atfl area this is the sinus tarsi that is below the fibula and little anterior to it it's not directly anterior to the lateral malleolus and posteriorly there is the calcaneo fibular area as well as the peroneal tendon where the sheath merges with the calcaneo fibular ligament so that's basic actually to the anatomy and if you are aware of that then you will be able to see tell you will be able to the, elicit the symptom of pain at that particular area and you will be able to point out what is probably the cause of this chronic pain even after an inversion injury and then on the back side there are there are differences this is retrocalcaneal bursitis the pain and swelling is anterior to the tendon and not at the tendon if it is at the tendon this is insertional actually tendonitis and if it is at the insertion of the tendon then this is hagland deformity pump bump or this is kind of insertional achilles tendonitis and the treatment uh, differs in uh, different situations so localizing the symptoms which i mean to say i'm not going to the details of each one of these spots localizing the symptoms by anatomy gives you a fair bit of an idea because we know what is lying under it is a superficial joint superficial structure of the body gives you a fair bit of idea similarly on the anterior surface there are so many points where we know the definite diagnosis the movement patient puts his finger to that point now how would the patient present this this is a lateral you see if if you have if you are asked about how there where will be the pain you will be knowing the patient will be pointing towards the subtalar joint on the lateral side is the beginning of the subtalar arthritis while here it will be probably an anterior pain so having uh, keeping that in mind you have a system of examination which we develop where we do a sssss first you examine the patient standing then you examine the patient sitting and so fine and then finally special tests well standing examination starts with gait which i have omitted omitted purposefully that will be a lengthy discussion in standing position you look for foot shape what kind of foot shape that is any of the pages quickly at least say once something what is that foot shape this one it's written there cavus foot so that is cavoverus foot we know that what are the problems associated with cavoverus foot if we look at that you need to elicit the whole neurology and there are problems even if it is an idiopathic cavoverus foot there will be problems associated with strain on the foot because of different different alignment of the subtalar and the and the transverse tarsal joint then you look at the foot shape and then after that you look at the heel uh, position of the heel that's a valgus heel what does it what idea does it give you on the right side it is probably a flat foot plano valgus foot or maybe a tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction and that is a varus heel a cava varus foot again a neurological examination is is mandated looking at the patient from behind you look at calf wasting you look at leg length is there any knee deformity and obviously you look at the skin scars and other changes in the foot standing examination then if you completed the inspection then you come to the standing examination on tiptoes this one test tells you a number of things if the patient stands on both the toes able to raise both the heels it's a test for gastrocnemius standing achilles it's a test for ankle plantar flexion it's a test for tibialis posterior it's a test test for subtalar joint if the if the heel goes into varus so with one single test you are testing all of these structures and if the patient is able to do that grossly everything is in order but then when you go on to a single stance it may become different so what would be the normal heel posture when the patient goes on a toe raise what will be a normal heel posture it will be in, it will be in varus obviously because of the uh, because of the foot biomechanics and if does if it if the does not go into varus if the heel remains into valgus then 
what would be the what what are the causes of that anybody girish subtalar arthritis or a flat, flat foot deformity yes or tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction as dr john said and a subtalar because you need to have an inversion at the joint so if the joint is abnormal you may have you may fail to have an inversion of the heel or if the tibialis posterior is dysfunctional you will fail to have an inversion of the heel so that gives you an idea about the function of these two now there are some special tests in standing which is a coleman block test coleman block test is done in cavo varus foot is very important to assess early cavo varus foot by coleman block test and what question are we wanting to answer when we ask the patient to stand with the medial border of the foot hanging from the hanging from the block there so if it is hanging from the block there you look at the heel from behind so what we are looking for anybody so i was asked to make it interactive i think it's very difficult to do that with one hour of uh, uh one hour like anybody what are, what are we looking at on what answer we are getting from the block again girish is our foot and ankle guy here i think <laughs> So what do we look for? Can you have a mic, please? Yeah. So if we consider the foot as a tripod, and the plantar fascia it is an inelastic structure. So if the uh, the hyper plantar flexion of the first metatarsal, which is a cause of cavo varus foot, which is called four foot drive and hind foot varus. So when the patient wants to stand. on the neutral foot because of the hyper plantar flexion of the first metatarsal it drives all to make it plantigrade it makes the hind foot in the varus to make the foot stable so this is a four foot drive and hind foot varus so this is the one information we get from the coleman block test the second thing is whether the deformity is flexible or not so if it is correcting to the valgus or the neutral it means the deformity is flexible so probably will go for the osteotomy and not fusion that so he has explained it very nicely i hope so understand the tripod that is that he mentions is that if the medial my index fingers is the medial ray and my middle finger is the lateral ray and my thumb is the heel then in cavo varus foot the first deformity that happens is the drop of the first ray because of weak plantar uh, weak uh, uh, peroneus longus which inserts at the base of the first uh, of the uh, of the first uh, metatarsal so there is a drop Uh, and then the foot goes into the four foot goes into pronation so understand that varus and pronation are different varus and adduction may be same but varus is deformity in this plane while pronation is deformity in the rotational plane so the first ray actually is pronated and the metatarsals are still in varus so when the patient walks with a pronated foot and drops the foot on the floor it actually what happens is that the first ray strikes the ground first and then the so i will let him do this i think the first ray strikes the ground first to bring the lateral ray down on the ground the heel has to go into varus so if the patient lands on the first ray the heel will go into varus to bring the foot plantigrade so that is what happens and the four, and the heel heel becomes varus secondary to the four foot four foot problem so if we if we obliterate the effect of the first ray on the on the on the on the weight bearing as we did this the first ray is hype is plantar flex so we have obliterated the effect of the first ray the heel doesn't have to go into varus because the lateral foot is already plantigrade so if the heel goes into varus by doing this it is a four foot driven heel varus and you don't need to correct the heel varus at all uh, if you have to correct anything by surgery then you have to just do the heel varus but this is the wrong way of doing it we have demonstrated the right way of doing is is this so that is a tripod sign and every time you look at foot deformities think about hind foot and fore foot as a tripod and every time there is a deformity there may be a opposite deformity in the hind foot and fore foot just because the heel the hind foot has to overwork sometimes to get the foot plantigrade if there is a fore foot deformity so that's very important to understand in foot and ankle biomechanics next is the examination the couch you have to sit in front of the patient make the patient comfortable and we know the silver scales test we all should know about it it differentiate it differentiates between the tightness of the tendo achilles being due to gastrocnemius or combined gastrocnemius problems so we must be able to elicit that 
and in uh, flat feet most of them are tight have tight TAs but the way to elicit tightness in them is to invert and lock the subtalar joint. So if you just examine the tightness of the T in flat foot by dorsiflexing the ankle the heel will go into eversion and the foot will go into hyper dorsiflexion but that's not the true test of tightness. Invert the subtalar joint and then see you'll be surprised they are hardly able to bring you will be hardly able to bring it even to the neutral position in most of the flat feet patients. So that's important again and then when we sit we look at the sole and sitting examination of three parts always look, feel and move. We start proximally or distally at one joint and go on systematically from ankle, subtalar, midfoot and then the forefoot and every joint we do look, feel and move. So what are we looking for and what we are feeling for depends on a number of things again the pathologies may be complex and there are special tests they are done sitting, there are some impingement tests for the anterior and lateral impingement, there are some tests for the posterior impingement when you forcibly plantar flex the ankle, posterior pain, when you try to resist, do a resistive plantar flexion of the great toe there, FHL, again a posterior impingement and then an ankle instability test, we all know as you have a latchment test in the knee, there is an anterior drawer and a varus inversion stress test which is positive in the cases of ankle instability. So we fail to do many of these tests in routine patients who come time and again with problems of pain and sense of giving way. If you elicit many of them will demonstrate a mechanical instability of that kind but that is not always present and it still may be an instability. So that's important to elicit. There are some special tests of tendon, peroneal tendons that's a dislocated peroneal tendons. Then again some HLS issues we should be able to elicit many times 20% of the Achilles ruptures are missed. But there are very simple tests, there's a calf squeeze test, we all know about that. So and that is how a patient of TA rupture will walk on the right side, there is no push off at all. So all of these things are important and then never forget the power, all muscles, the neurological examination. I'm going to skip that part because it will become a very very lengthy talk. We can talk about a couple of hours on examination alone but I'm going to miss it but we must be able to differentiate the deformities that are there in the toes and then neurological part, pulsations and monofilament testing in diabetes is very very important and we should not be missing it. Again look at the footwear but never advise them not to wear heels. I had one patient not to that extent but she was she did became emotional when I when I tell her that you have to avoid heels. So basics, examination, listen properly, do a standing examination, do a sitting proper examination, supine and there are some special tests for special conditions. So any, any questions about the examination part? Any comments, any questions? Anything? I know foot and ankle is not that interesting, isn't it? So, but any of the PGs? Or should we go to the radiology? It's, it's, it's going to be very boring again. The next section is going to be very, very boring. I'm not going to go into the details. It's already been discussed what are the ankle x-rays and how to read ankle x-rays. I'm not going into the details of tibiofibular overlap. The tibiofibular clear space in the AP view is different. In the mortis view is different. The fibula should be posterior on the lateral view, posterior to the, um, I mean it should be overlapping on the posterior posterior part of the tibia and not anywhere else. Again mortis view, we all know about this. There are some special views which we fail to take, that is what I am going to concentrate on a bit. This is a broadens view which is important, which is very important when we do a calcaneal fracture surgery. When you do a calcaneal fracture surgery you need to you need to look into the joint as we do a peel on surgery you can't look into the joint unless you distract the joint. If you do a calcaneal fracture surgery and you are reconstructed the subtalar joint you will not be able to look, look into the fracture surface. So you depend on the CM or you do a dry arthroscopy. If you depend on the CM this is the x-ray which helps you and shows you all aspects of the of the subtalar joint. So 10 degrees will look like this, 20 like this and 40 degrees will like this and if you have done a fusion this is again a good view to look at the subtalar joint fusion whether it is happening or not. A Harris axial view for the alignment of the hind foot to the leg as well as in calcaneal fractures for varus or valgus placement of the tuberosity. 
tailless fractures extremely important in the operation theater to visualize if, if you're not able to do it obviously before the surgery but at least in the in the operation theater we must be able to do the canale view to look at the whole uh, of the of the tailless neck uh, which will look like this in profile so that's very important we must do this is about trauma part if you do a cold surgery for an ankle x-ray it is very important to do a weight bearing x-ray extremely important whenever i write a foot and ankle x-ray is always 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 it's a weight bearing x-ray in cold patients because the information that you get is entirely different and there are ways to take weight bearing x-rays they can be special cassettes the patients can stand on the cassettes and there can be a difference of earth and sky there a normal non weight bearing x-ray and a weight bearing x-ray demonstrating a list frank problem so that's the only thing i'm going to cover about x-rays and radiology because i hate because it's, it will become extremely boring if i go in on about more specialized x-rays for for cold foot and ankle problems so we are going to go to some basic trauma concepts about ankle fractures yes devashish so for ap it's very simple so ap is very simple you have the patient stand on the x ray cassette or you have on the table and there is a cassette under it on that and then you do a straight uh, anterior posterior shooting down but when you do a lateral x ray then you have to have a radio lucent platform kind of a, a block on which the patient stands and the x ray beams come from the lateral side and the cassette is on one side foot has to be plantar grade standing on the so when you do ap you do both feet together and when you do lateral you do one foot at a time yeah can we have a mic please uh, we take uh, ap and oblique views most of the time for trauma cases not exact lateral so when lateral is required when oblique is required well in all trauma cases you take an anterior posterior you take a lateral and you take an oblique view in every trauma patient you take oblique view as also because there are some areas which will be visualized better in the oblique views and there are some lis frank injuries where you have to see the alignment of the metatarsal bases with the cuneiforms so you need to take whenever you have a foot injury all three views will help you any other questions about radiology when do you need stress views okay so stress views is uh, is done for first is that for the suspected lis frank when you have a ligamentous lis frank injury which is not obvious on the x ray then you can stress those joints and do a stressed x rays of the foot to see the opening of the uh, the, the tarsal metatarsal joints in chronic ligamentous injuries when you have mechanical instabilities you have an anterior drawer x ray where you take a lateral view drawing the ankle anteriorly and you have a varus stressed view where you do an ap of the ankle taking the ankle into varus and you look for talar tilting in the ap view in varus stress and in the anterior drawer you for look for anterior translation of the talus on the tibia so these are the three important stress x rays in foot and ankle any anything else so should we go to the basics of some of the fractures specific fractures so when we have choices about treatment and we we should be no we should be following them uh, as far as to our best of knowledge and ability but you may have many choices and when you don't want to you know you don't know how to use those choices then you may end up in misery again you know but you may be having one choice then what do you do with that so you may have different difficult problems in life but you know sometimes you have to just live with them if i am in that situation then i say that okay beer is a proof that god loves us and wants us to be happy so you hit a beer bar and enjoy your life but then obviously you there are situations where you need to know your concepts very clearly and follow the the dictum and the advice so you don't end up with with problems i'm going to skip uh, posterior malleolus syndesmosis have been covered extensively in in the previous session maybe a bit about diabetics but concepts of stability 
Concepts of stability. Let's look at this fracture treated by me about about 10 years back. So, anybody wants to take this up? Anybody wants to take? I don't have a CT because we didn't do a CT 10 years ago. But this is the fracture. There is a comminuted fibula. There is a medial malleolus small. There is a posterior malleolus small. How would you proceed? This is a lady. This is a lady non-diabetic. She was 58 years old at that time. Anybody? Again? Oh, Girish again. <laughs> I think he's the only guy who's interested in foot and ankle surgery out of you all. So again, like any ankle t uh, fracture, we need to see the soft tissue status. Yeah, so uh, soft tissues are okay. So how would, is, how would you fix this? Yeah. So again, the uh, I will start the surgery with getting the fibula length back. Yeah. Uh, probably we'll uh, go for the posterior lateral incision. Uh, getting the length of fibula, uh, fixing with the K-wire or with the plate one screw above and last down. After that I will go from, from the same incision to fix the posterior malleolus. Uh, so do we have a CT images? We don't have we the don't. CT. We, we didn't do a CT. This was 10 years ago. Yeah. So, so posterior malleolus, posterior malleolus, uh, would, you, would you fix the fibula because the fibula obviously appears to be a bit comminuted here at that area. So, so would you fix the posterior malleolus first or the fibula first? We had discussed this. So, which is simple? Wh whatever looks simple, I will go for the fixation that because it is ultimately getting the advantage of ligamento dexis. So, if you're getting the uh, uh, posterior malleolus fixed, you're getting the uh, reduction of the fibula easy. If you're getting the uh, reduction, sir, sir, the vice versa. Okay. Yes, sir. Long time back, you said there are no CT that time. Yes, sir. Every case, we used to take a traction view. Yes, sir. And traction view in three would tell us what is the status of soft tissues and fall backs. I still believe that the soft tissues also are a very important aspect of vascularization. And that tells you a lot of things. So such case, olden times are now also. Before CT, I would take a traction view. Okay, so. The traction will give me a lot of information. Okay. So that's, and, uh, a, that's an opinion, attraction. Yeah. Yes, sir, please. Give me, give me a track so, of time, uh, Devashis. Give me a track of time. If you consider the ankle joint as a ring. As a ring. So the medial malleolus, the posterior malleolus, and lateral malleolus are a part of a ring. Yes. And uh, some... Uh, medial, that's the medial one. Yeah, there is a medial fracture. So, some part of this ring is uh, fracturing or getting injured in uh, <coughs> compression and some of it is injured in, uh, in tension, tension. Now, looking at this, I, I think if the fibula is comminuted, it's most likely that the medial malleolus and the posterior malleolus are not comminuted, usually. That has been my experience. Uh, I would like you to tell you uh, okay. on that. Okay. So, I would perhaps uh, defer a little bit from uh, Dr. Okay. Motwani and I would probably go and fix the, med uh, the posterior malleolus first for the posterior lateral incision because okay. that's going to be easier to fix. That will help me get my fibula length back and put the fibula in place and uh, posterior plating on the fibula. Okay. And then perhaps uh, you could, if it's as it's in the prone position, you could just flex the knee and uh, continue your fixation without twisting the patient over and fix for the in, medial, uh, medial, for the medial malleolus. So, so I absolutely agree with that approach and that's what probably Girish also mentioned. So when you have this kind of injury and you want to fix all three ring, all three parts, then you look at the less comminuted part. And here if the fibula is more comminuted, then probably posterior malleolus is not that comminuted. So you go in and fix it. But that was 10 years ago. So, so this is what we did what I did actually, we, we didn't fix the posterior malleolus. So this was fifth, two weeks after the surgery and we didn't leave it that way in the operation theater. We obviously did a stress test also, we did it, but and it was it was not moving. But this was two weeks, appeared that it was already going into valgus and this was, this was some kind of a VIP patient and one of my first surgeries in a corporate hospital there. And at three weeks, it is obviously moving out more. So, we already know what has gone wrong. We have discussed uh, what should have been done already. So, there is a wide syndesmosis there now. It was not, it was stressed somehow. We, probably my force was not enough. It did not move a lot. But here at three weeks, there is a wide gap in the syndesmosis. There was a comminuted fibular fracture. Probably the fibula is in, is in shortening, a bit shortening. 
the medial malleolus fracture is not fixed properly probably the KYs are not there and that is the whole construct is moving. So, something has gone wrong we missed something there is a combination at the syndesmosis also retrospectively looking. So, another important point if you have a comminuted fibular fracture at the level of the syndesmosis it adds to the instability it is not only the posterior malleolus. So, even if I had fixed the posterior malleolus probably this syndesmosis would have remained unstable because the anterior anterior uh, syndesmotic ligament the anterior inferior tibial fibular ligament is also avulsed with the chapus tuber, tuber, uh, tubercle and the interosseous ligament is also gone because they are all not functional because of comminution at that level. So, that is adding to the syndesmosis and is there only a medial malleolus fracture question are we sure that this was small medial malleolus fracture only anybody when you have a small medial malleolus injury a very small fragment which is infra which is kind of a collicular revulsion it is below the axilla of the joint then what should we look for Girish what should we look for so, so deltoid because deltoid is posteriorly and the injury may have continued but we missed everything there we missed everything there the same way as you feel after missing this goal and then what do you do what, how would you treat this patient now that is what we did we removed the medial hardware and we replaced these screws with syndesmotic screws closed the joint we forgot about this bit of shortening that we created probably the patient was osteoporotic even in that age and I was not sure if I remove the plate and try to lengthen the fibula I will get purchase and a different kind of this was the only fragment available and different screws because already a locking plate. So, I just did this and this united but obviously a with bit of a bit of a shortening of the fibula and about 12 months she already has some arthritis but did well I mean there was not much pain there. So, we missed a deltoid injury when you have a small medial malleolus fragment well always always there is most of the situations there is a complete deltoid rupture. So, this is a very unstable situation we missed a syndesmotic injury and we also missed a. So, the concepts of stability are very important in ankle that is what I mean to say all it is we mentioned it about this being a ring. So, think about it as a as a as a mint and the pelvis. So, this is a ring again and every part of the ring is not bony. When you have a break at one place it is fairly stable situation nothing much is going to happen it might be undisplaced, but when you have a double break it is a it is an unstable situation and remember that that second break may not be a fracture Just an isolated fibular fracture with a medial deltoid is an unstable injury. So, it has to be treated differently from a stable injury and in case you have a break at three places if you have a trimalleolar fracture this is an extremely unstable situation it has to be addressed all three structures should probably be fixed with due regard to some dispute about posterior malleolus some of those may not need fixation, but you need to stabilize them properly. Again what is Taylor shift that is the concept about the ring. So, the ring becomes unstable the talus will shift if the talus shifts it is a it is a problematic situation we all know why the joint surface contact area leading to arthritis and all that, but whenever there is a talus shift there is a medial injury about a couple of millimeters is described in literature intact del deep deltoid can allow up to 2 millimeters of gap on the medial side, but anything beyond that is probably a more more than more than uh, other injuries which you are which you are looking at in the x-ray. So, we all know that this is an unstable situation, but what about this one? This is what we are talking about it is a it is a it is a single break or it is a double break there is no fracture on the medial side, but it is a double break because if you see sequential x-rays of this patient there is a medial deltoid injury. So, this is an unstable situation and this is superior external rotation type 4 injury and it needs to be fixed by surgery not looking at the first x-ray which was showing an undisplaced fibular fracture. So, isolated fibular fractures the concept is always test for stability on the medial side by doing stress x-rays and these stress x-rays may be a uh, gravity stress x-ray like this or a dorsiflexion external rotation stress x-ray like that. Again a small medial malleolar fracture 
which is anterior colliculus avulsion. The injury has continued posteriorly in majority of situation and created a deep deltoid rupture. So a medial malleolus look for a deep deltoid in many situations deep this deep deltoid will enter into the joint and will prevent medial closure. So this medial clear space will still become wide even after you have looked, fixed everything nicely. So you need to go in medially and remove that deltoid in folding to get the medial reduction. So that is the key point these about the stability. So remember that the double break is potentially unstable and it may not always be bony on all sides. Taylor shifts means there is a significant medial injury and the dictum is when you have fixed everything in the surgery, stress the joints even if you have fixed all three columns because there can be situations when you have fixed all three sides, there still can be an instability of syndesmosis. If you have a comminuted fibula fracture and very rarely you have a posterior malleolus with interosseous ligament injuries which have been described but uncommon. So that's it. So what about ankle adequate radiology? We will quickly skip through this because we all know what this is. This is a highly unstable injury. You can't treat looking at this x-ray. This prompts you to do casting but look at the fibula higher up and then we know that this is an extremely unstable situation. This is, it will require syndesmotic fixation. There are some videos there but not that important. I think we know what, what should be done here. What is the role of CT in ankle fractures? Can we read this x-ray? This x-ray was sent to me in the middle of night and he said I am sending this patient in a slab. I said I don't, I can't identify the fracture. What is, I can't identify what kind of fracture it is. I can see there is a fracture but I don't know what is happening. On the lateral view I don't know what is happening. Looks like there is there is a medial malleolus, probably some fracture there. How would you do? What would you do? I asked my resident to do a CT on that <coughs> and that is what it was. Look at the coronal and look at the sagittal cuts. So this is obviously should have been investigated. We did investigate it and looking at the CT we now know that this kind of injury and this requires a posterior medial plate for various reasons. Again. Uh, it will be too lengthy if you go into the detailed discussions. We did a posterior medial plating through the posterior medial approach. That was a fracture. That's the medial malleolus there. And this is the tibialis posterior tendon. Provisional reduction with wires and a posterior medial plate was used. So CT scan in ankle fractures is required in any fracture dislocation. If there is a significant posterior malleolus fracture, supination, adduction injuries because there may be a medial impaction injury and then when the fracture pattern is unclear. In all of these situations, you need to do a CT scan. So about the posterior malleolus, let's skip this because we have covered it in the in the talk there very nicely. <coughs> the classifications and there are some suggestions, it's not the size, the decision to fix is based on this classification now and we know all four, all type 4 will need surgery, type 2 and type 3, type 3 mostly need surgery, type 2 it's, it's not the size again because type 2 is only about, it is documented is only about 50 per, 14 percent of the surface area in most cases, not 25 as we said. But it involves the fibular notch and it is an intercalary fragment or any type of posterior subluxation. These are the indications for, um, for, for surgery on the posterior malleolus, not, not the size. So again posterior malleolus, posterior lateral approach fixation of the posterior malleolus, we do that more frequently now. So we know about the posterior malleolus and that's a video we have about the posterior, posterior lateral approach. This is the sural nerve, all important which you need to protect in the in this. In, incision is midway between the fibula and the tendoachillis and you protecting the sural nerve as you go inside and you incise the deep fascia, you will directly on the posterior compartment, you will see the peroneal tendons on the lateral side. That's a, when you incise the deep fascia there, FHL will come into focus, peronea are taken laterally, FHL taken on the medial side and that's the fracture there. Very simple straightforward approach and using the metaphyseal spikes as your guide, you reduce this fracture and put a buttress plate on the posterior side for the posterior malleolus and through the same incision you can fix the, fix the fibular fracture. So that is pushing the posterior malleolus down and back using the metaphyseal spikes as your guide, fixing provisionally with a, with a K wire and then putting an under contoured, slightly under contoured buttress plate to support on the posterior side. 
Now that is how it was fixed. And then about syndesmosis losses again, we are going to skip uh, the thing because it has been covered very nicely in the in the last session itself. But the only thing I want to show is the open reduction of the syndesmosis there. So here is a situation of a comminuted fibular fracture and you know there is a syndesmotic injury there and there is a very small chip of the posterior malleolus which may be difficult to fix. So we go in, we do a lateral incision straight on the fibula and we go full thickness, take the incision anteriorly and open the syndesmosis through the same incision. Now I have opened the fibular fracture but we are not fixing the fracture. So once you look at the syndesmosis you will be seeing a gap there, a wide gap there and a small fragment which usually is associated which is an avulsion of the, the chapert ligament there, the anterior tibiofibular, inferior tibiofibular ligament and once you have aligned the syndesmosis properly under vision by palpation and by vision and you have clamped it into the right position, you will see the proximal comminuted fibular, fibular fracture will fall in its place. The length is not a problem anymore because you have reduced the distal fragment out to length. If you have a situation where you have an oblique or a transverse fibular fracture which is uncommon in this situation, then you may primarily fix that. But if you have a comminuted fibular fracture where the length issue is always there, you can open the syndesmosis, go in and reduce the syndesmosis and you will see that the length is restored even before you have uh, uh, gone on to the fibular fracture. So once we fix it, uh, we reduce the syndesmosis with a, with a clamp you see the fibular fracture appears to be falling in place. Fix it provisionally with a couple of KYs going from posterior to anterior, leaving the space for the plate, later application of plate there. Once you have done that, you take an x-ray and you will see that the fibular length is, is maintained well. And then you put on your lateral plate and through that put syndesmotic screws and fix the lateral malleolus there. So you see the length out of the fibula, you see that the isomotis view the fibula is going right up to the lateral process of the talus where it should be. And then you substitute your K wires before you remove them, put this in the smotic screws and fix it. So that is how oh, we fix it. So in the situations where you have a comminuted fibular fracture with the syndesmosis, you may attempt to reduce the syndesmosis before the fibular fracture to get out to length, which is easier to do than going for a comminuted fibular fracture. So that is what it is about syndesmosis about diabetics now that's a, that's a, rajiv was uh, we were discussing and, uh, and he was saying that there's so many complications that we see in diabetics what we have to remember is that we have to be more aggressive in un, in complicated diabetics in fixation in complicated diabetics you do a pro tibia fixation if you have failures like this you will have failures like this because this is not an adequate fixation for a diabetic you have to fix like this in a complicated diabetes. This is called pro-tibial fixation and unless we do that, many of these patients will fail and the rate of amputation in complicated diabetics with ankle fractures is about 8%. Complicated diabetes would mean uncontrolled diabetes with, with the neuropathy, retinopathy, nephropathy, these patients, these are the candidates for this kind of fixation. Obviously a co non-complicated, completely controlled diabetes, it is treated as a non-diabetic. We are talking about a complicated diabetes where a pro-tibial fixation is required. So anything we want to discuss about ankle fractures? Devashis, we have run out of time. Still have 10 minutes, okay. I have gone on and on like that, I think. Girish, yes sir, please. Can we have mic, please? Mic, mic. Sorry. Why the extra precaution in complicated diabetics? Extra precautions and complicated diabetes because the complication rates are high, because of a number of issues, because of the neuropathy, because of the sensory loss, because of the osteoporosis, because of the vasculopathy, everything is bad for healing. Everything tissue is bad. Healing. You're talking about the tissue healing or the bone healing? Both, sir. Both are problematic. Okay. Both are problematic. Tissue healing as well as bone healing because you have a situation of microangiopathy, you have a situation of neuropathy, these patients are unreliable also, sometimes they don't follow your advice, so you have to be aggressive in fixing them. The, 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 the concept is that if you have a complicated diabetes, you have to double the amount of immobilization, double the time when you put the patient non-weight bearing as compared to normal patients and as far as possible 
do rigid fixation with extra long plates and extra screws. The principle of three screws proximity and distance does not apply in that situation. And when do you remove these long screws? We don't remove them, we we'll let them break. Okay. Uh, sir, I had a question. Uh, what is your take on uh, injecting PRP in peroneal tendinitis? Out of the window. <laughs> Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do PRPs. Sorry, sorry about. It. If if anybody is here who does PRPs, well, will due regard to them. I don't have any faith in PRPs at all. No, so uh, it's not there in the literature. So you would not advocate that. I would not advocate it. Yes. Okay. And how do you treat these patients then? Which patients who have chronic peroneal tendinitis and have what? that pain uh, always on the chronic adversary. peroneal tendinitis is a difficult situation. Now you have to elicit, if it is a sports person, I mean initially obviously you have to immobilize them, give them rest in a cast or in a boot and wait it out, do some physiotherapy and see how they behave. If they don't and if they are associated with a bad tendinosis with a tear, then obviously you are obliged to go in and repair those, debride and repair those. Debride and repair. Repair, yeah. And uh, second is uh, in chronic plantar fasciitis, when uh, say on the lateral view of the x-ray of the foot you see a big uh, spur there. Uh, is it okay to go with uh, cortisone injections or again PRP or again exercise forms the basis of? The best results even today are with exercise and physiotherapy. The literature proves that a, a rigidly followed protocol of plantar fascia stretching, tendoachillis stretching along with some other physiotherapy modality gives 80% success rate at 3 to 4 weeks. This is better than PRP is still reported, better than any steroid injections. And steroid injections, if at all you have to give, it is advisable to give under radiology control where the exact location of the injection is documented. It has to be above the fascia, between the bone and the fascia, not in the plantar fascia. The complications of injecting in the fascia are severe. If the fascia ruptures, there is a problem. Complications of injecting in the fat pad are severe. If the fat pad atrophies, then it is an untreatable problem. Then you, then you have a difficult issue. So I don't inject steroids at all. I don't do PRPs. I always do physiotherapy with stretching exercises and tell the patient there is no other treatment for this. Okay, so thank you. And yes, sir, sir. Uh, sorry, uh, in grade two inversion injuries of the ankle, uh, is taping good or is giving a mobile cast good? So say with a more grade so two softer tears of the lateral ligament of the lateral ligament complex. Yes. I just put them in a simple brace, stirrup brace and ask them to weight bear as tolerate and do mobilization exercises as tolerated by the patient with some ice packs and all that stuff. Okay. Sir. Thank you sir. Yes sir. With syndesmotic injuries, what is being observed is 30 to 40 percent, it is mal reducing in incisura and stabilized by screw. Yes sir. So lately, uh, it is uh, my practice at least. After fixing the fibula, I open up the uh, tibio fibula joint, look at the attachment of a ETFL, confirm that ETFL is reduced first. Once I am happy that uh, ligament is well reduced, then I push the fibula into the incisura and under direct image control then put the screws. Yes, sir. Now this gives me a definite sign called as Mercedes sign. Yes, sir which you are very sure that you have well reduced in incisura yes, sir. and then your screws would go in a proper direction. Yes, sir. What's your take on this? I think that's the uh, current trend and that is fairly accepted protocol to open, reduce the syndesmosis because we all know when we reduce and fix the syndesmosis under x-ray control only, many of them are mal reduced post-operatively and there are reports we know now that we do a CT after, after syndesmosis fixation under x-ray control and many of them not reduced. So the, trend is for an open reduction definitely. Yes sir. What is the role of the orthotics, orthotics, you know the footwear? Yes sir. You said physiotherapy. Yes because sir. Because my experience was in addition to physiotherapy. Correct sir. If you give them foot analysis. Yes sir. And in a footwear, yes, I think sir. they get much, both exercise footwear, they get much more relief. That is right sir, I agree to that. So sometimes you add insoles add insoles, custom made insoles or padded insoles to help them uh, with the pain point, pressure point, especially in plantar fasciitis, this can really be helpful. I agree. Yes, sir. Uh, 
let like him ask me. He has been standing for a long time. After that, you, after him, you can please. Okay. Anyway, what is your threshold for operating a collateral ligament injury? For a what is your threshold for operating uh, a collateral ligament injury? Lateral collateral. Lateral as well as the deltoid ligaments. Well, lateral collateral acutely you don't repair them. Okay. There is no because there was only one study about 10, 20 years back. I think about 12 years back, which said that acute repair of these ligaments in athletic population gives better results. But it has not been substantiated. So acute lateral ligament sprains are never repaired surgically at the moment. There are there are some reports coming up now, but we are still not sure. You only operate on lateral ligaments when there is an instability after an inversion sprain, which is not very common. So you have an instability situation after a sprain, six months down the line, patient is still symptomatic. You analyze it properly and see what is the cause of problem and you have, if you have ruled out everything else possible with an unresolved ankle sprain because there are a number of issues which are possible and then you document that there is a lateral instability then you should reconstruct the lateral ligament that is the indication. Right. How about the deltoid like in the case that you showed that there is a small chip of the medial malleolus. You don't the repair them acutely now now it has become debatable <coughs> but about two years before today from prior to today there was almost okay. consensus that deltoid should not be repaired acutely even in situation of fractures. If you have reduced the medial clear space and you have fixed the two pillars properly then the talus is there is nowhere the talus can go laterally. Right. So it will heal by, by, but there are some people there is school of thought coming up now who are acutely repairing the deltoid for various reasons but still not accepted. Okay. While fixing syndesmosis. Sorry. While fixing syndesmosis, syndesmosis. Uh, should we always use clamp for should, reduction? Should we always leg, use clamp, syndesmotic clamp, or only leg principle can be worked? Only be used. leg principle, leg screw principle for syndesmotic fixation. No, you have to clamp it. Clamp it. You have to clamp it always. Always, because you have to keep it reduced till you have fixed past your screws. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Same question. So. So I think I have overstretched the time, I have left a lot of things which I had so I can't go on and on because I already bored you for a number of things with, with a number of things. So I am going to close it over here, any questions are most welcome still. I thank you very much.